If your introduction to Star Trek began with Deep Space Nine or Voyager, then you are probably unaware of what is considered the greatest non-fiction book ever written on the subject of Star Trek. Published just before the beginning of the third and final season of the original series, for old-time Star Trek fans, this book was one of the very first books they ever read on the subject of Star Trek. The book on how to write for TV, the complete story of how the USS Enterprise was designed, the original concept behind the show, backgrounds for the characters, the whole authentic history. This book took a weekly television show and brought it to life in a way for you and I that we never expected. By giving us an unheard of glimpse into exactly how a TV series was made. With this book, Star Trek became so much more than just a science fiction TV series. It suddenly became a living, breathing labor of love. Most of the people who have ever worked on a Star Trek production, whether it be television or movies, have identified this book as being instrumental in their decision to pursue a career in entertainment. So join us after the break as we take a look at one of the most influential books about Star Trek ever written. Now step back in time with me, if you will. The year is 1968. The top song of the year is I Heard It Through the Grapevine. The top toy at Christmas is a brand new model car line called Hot Wheels. Today, in 2022, with an estimated 4 billion Hot Wheels produced, there are now more Hot Wheels on the planet today than there are actual vehicles. And three of the top movies of 1968 were 2001 A Space Odyssey, Planet of the Apes, and Rosemary's Baby. Peggy Fleming takes the gold at the Olympics, and in doing so becomes the first of many Olympians that will be idolized and adored by the American public. Apollo 8 would spend Christmas orbiting the moon. During this mission, the most famous photo ever taken from outside our atmosphere is taken by William Anders, Earthrise. And on Star Trek, the first interracial kiss is featured on U.S. television. Now, for years it had been erroneously claimed that this was television's first interracial kiss, but that honor actually belongs to the 1962 televised play In Your Small Corner, which aired on BBC. But needless to say, far more people saw the Star Trek kiss, which is why it is referenced so much more often. Now, as I mentioned before, the making of Star Trek was written during the filming of season two. It was released in 1968, just before the premiere of the third season on NBC. Now, as such, it doesn't contain anything about the famous letter-writing campaign to save Star Trek. In fact, the book ends with the weight of the cancellation of Star Trek hanging heavily in the air. This results in the book not really containing much information concerning Season 3. In fact, the very last page or so of the book is a touching testimony to Star Trek's impact on the people who have encountered it. So perfectly written that 50 years later, I remember the question that it posed on its pages. Wither Star Trek? Now, just like P.T. Barnum before him, Gene Roddenberry always had an eye open for projects that could either bring in new income or promote his current shows. Stephen Poe, who Gene had met as a result of Poe representing AMT in their negotiations with Desi Lu over model kits, had suggested writing a book about Gene's quest to create the series, sell it to a network, and then manage its production. Gene then made a deal to provide Poe with complete access to everything related to Star Trek, and in exchange, Gene would get co-writer credit as well as having the final say over context and editing. Now, as it turned out, Gene never responded to a single request for feedback while the book was being written. He did, however, make a half-hearted attempt at the last minute to edit some of the book, but the net results were that Poe did 100% of the work and got 50% of the royalties. Now, I was about eight years old when I discovered this book in one of my school's annual scholastics book fairs. 
Now, if you take into consideration that I grew up in a backwoods area in Virginia, think Walton's Mountain, it's a testimony at just how successful this book was that it could even be found in small towns like mine. Now, I had previously already discovered the James Blish adaptations to the actual episodes. I keenly remember watching each month, looking to see if a new one would come out. This book said Star Trek, so I got my folks to buy it for me. At this point, my parents viewed Star Trek in the same light as they viewed Scooby-Doo. For better or for worse, they would see this book completely change my interest in Star Trek from that point forward. And boy, did it ever. Now, this book has been recognized over and over again by famous people who cite it as their inspiration for working in entertainment. Here you see a few quotes from various Star Trek professionals. Mike Akuda, Ronald D. Moore, Mark Altman, all referencing the fact that this book was inspirational for them in getting started in the business. As for the statistics, it is the most reprinted Star Trek book Ever. It was reprinted 33 times through 1993. However, it has not been reprinted again for almost three decades. The reason for it being out of print for so long is related to licensing issues. Now, Ballantine Books is now part of the Bartlesman Publishing Group. And this particular group has no real incentive to do anything with the book on their own right now. To update the book would be pretty complex. First off, it was produced off standard print plates. There's no digital copy anywhere. So they would have to digitize the book and then get it edited again. Then additional chapters would have to be written and edited because let's face it, we would want something added for the third season at the least and possibly even all the way up through the current Star Trek. Who knows? Illustrations would have to be prepared. And then of course, let's not forget the rights. Unfortunately, Roddenberry and Whitfield are both dead. So those rights would have to be negotiated with their estates, which is also a complex matter. So Bertelsmann's idea is they're going to sit on it until somebody gives them a pile of money. Now, once you get into the book, this book really shines a light on the sheer force of nature that was Gene Roddenberry. It starts from the beginning with Roddenberry, his ideas for the show, and his struggles to get it picked up first by a studio, Desi Lu, and then with a network, ultimately NBC. It also gives me a greater appreciation for everything Gene had to do just to get the show on the air with the vision that he had wanted. Roddenberry was not perfect by any means. We definitely know that now. He had some faults, and sometimes he required others to make his visions a watchful reality such as Robert Justman, D.C. Fontana, Herbert Salo, among others. But he had an idea, and he stuck with it. He stood on his principles. And that idea was to create a smart science fiction show, not a kiddie show. And that's the reason why Gene's face is the first face you will see when looking through the book's 64 pages of photographs. Now, much of what we know today originated within the pages of this book which makes it all the more tragic that it's been out of print and hidden away for the last three decades. It was in this book that we were first told about the makeup tests that caused so much trouble as they were preparing to shoot Venus Stint as a Green Orion slave girl. The story, in case you haven't heard it, goes like this. Jean brought an actress in to test the green makeup for the cameras. They shot the scene one day, and when the dailies came back the next day, all traces of green was gone, leaving only the Caucasian actress. This went back and forth for three days. Every day they would send it over green, and it would come back normal. Paint her greener, come back normal. They finally found out that the technician who was processing the daily films thought the green skin was a color bleed, so he kept modifying the film until the actress's natural skin color was restored. Now, while the book never names the actress they used for the tests, it was, in fact, Majel Barrett. Here you can see one of the test shots. It is also the very first time that we see the early sketches that Matt Jeffries did while designing the Enterprise. The sketches are provided with a story that is often incorrectly repeated amongst Star Trek fans. Namely, that the original design that Matt had for the Enterprise was to have it upside down. Kind of like the version you see right here. In actuality, Matt had designed the Enterprise to be upright. The story gets confused when he actually makes a small four-inch wooden model so that Gene can see the finalized design in three dimensions. 
Unfortunately, when they hung the model for Gene's inspection, they actually hung the model upside down. Someone actually remarked that they liked the way this looked, and Matt quickly jumped in to explain that the model is actually, in fact, going to be upright with the saucer on top. However, the book would cause another major misconception about the 11-foot shooting model. It actually reported that the model was 14 feet in length, and it wasn't. It was 11 foot 2 inches. It also described the saucer as being 10 feet in diameter. It wasn't. And then lastly, it said the entire model was made from sheet plastic, except for the nacelles, which were made of wood. Another thing that the book tells us, which is literally forgotten trivia, is that the first pilot, the film we call The Cage today, had actually already been renamed to the Menagerie prior to shooting, and it was not changed as a result of being cut into two pieces in the series. Here you can clearly see it is the Menagerie, and first day of location, Friday, November 27th, 1964, Studio Culver, Stage 16. The book also goes on to tell you that the first pilot finished up at $630,000, which in 2022 funds is $5.8 million. As I said earlier, the work in this book is highly influential. Not only was it the first very detailed and specialized book title on the production aspects of Star Trek, including detailed photographs of set designs and props, it was also the very first one for a television show in general. Or for that matter, one of the very first ones for a motion picture. Shown here is an example of the complete budget breakdown for the production of the second pilot, which actually ended up going over this budget. In today's number, the second pilot cost approximately $2.9 million. That means that they were already into the tune of $8.7 million in our dollars today, and they had not received a firm commitment from NBC on whether or not there was going to be a TV series. Finally, this book set the template for all, quote, making of, unquote, reference books on the subject matter that have followed afterwards. Right down to the name, making of Twin Peaks, making of X-Files. It's just a blueprint, and people have followed it every step of the way since then. Some of the other documents that it shows us for the first time that we have access to are shooting schedules, which we already saw a small part of previously that identified the Menagerie was shooting on November 27th. The larger one you see here gives you much more information about what sets and what scenes and what people are going to be involved that day in shooting. It also showed us call sheets, which you can see on the right here, which lists the people that have to be in and when they have to be in, when they go to makeup and things of that nature. For many of us, these set photos were our first peek behind the curtain. Notice the open ceiling in sickbay, which reveals the catwalk and lights that shone down onto the set. Now, an interesting story in the book, we discovered that studio prop makers delivered eight laser guns at a cost of $7,000. Unfortunately, they looked like toys, and you got to see them in the cage. After the cage was done, Gene really wanted them reworked. So he would go outside the studio and purchase what we would know today as phasers from a local business. This is an arrangement he would pursue over the entire length of the original TV series. As a result, although his builds were prominently featured in the book and the show, Hua Chang was the one major production staffer that was not mentioned by name in this book, or in any other book, for well over a decade after the series went off the air. The reason was he was not a member of the Prop Makers Union, and therefore should not have been working on television props. But that, that's a story for another video. The real treat in this book, for me, was this diagram that showed the physical layout of the sets that were used for filming interior shots of the Enterprise. The book is filled with designs and early diagrams, like these two for the shuttle bay and conference room. You will most definitely see that this form returned again and again and again through Deep Space Nine, Next Generation, and Voyager. Now, a major source of confusion for decades came from the inclusion of design sketches by Matt Jeffries for the Klingon D7-class battlecruiser, which was not seen 
on Star Trek until the third season, which means that when the book was published, it revealed drawings of a ship no one had ever seen before. Now, because of this book, there's been a misconception that the D7 was built at the studio's request, and it was not. As it turns out, Jeffries designed the ship exclusively for AMT, who eagerly wanted to do another model because the Enterprise was doing really, really well. He did it in his own spare time, did not do it for the studio, because they didn't commission it, and despite assertions by numerous authors, fans, and even the franchise itself, he finally set the record straight in 2002 in an interview with Star Trek the Magazine, Volume 2, Issue 9, where he pointed out that he had done this all for himself, but once the studio found out about it, they appropriated one of the two tooling masters to use for filming. You can see that in the photograph here. A couple of last things I want to throw out to you as we get to the end of this video. The book actually told us that the Enterprise had a, quote, entertainment center, unquote, that would be a three-dimensional room that you would be in and the story would take place all around you. They referred to it as a sophisticated extension of holography. Okay, we know that budget would not allow that in the 1960s. It first did show up, though, in the animated series in the early 70s. And, of course, the holodeck became just as big a star as the transporters did when it was introduced in the next generation. Another thing that it tells us is that the pilots were not shot on the famous Stage 9 on Gower Street. Instead, they were filmed on the Culver City lot, and after the pilots were done, they had to completely disassemble them, move them, and then reassemble them in their new home, where they would stay for decades. And lastly, it gave us an inside look at personalities of men who ran the show. Gene Roddenberry, Herb Salo, John D.F. Black, Bob Justman. <laughs> There's one chain of memos in the book pertaining to Vulcan names that if you read it, it sounds like a classic Who's on First routine by Abbott and Costello. These guys really had a lot of fun when they did this. However, I cannot move on from this video without pointing out a quote that Gene Roddenberry had very prominently in this book. And he said, no matter how many times NASA describes the outfit of the future, it always ended up sounding like long underwear. This photo showing us the recreation deck from Star Trek The Motion Picture shows us what irony really looks like. Okay, it looks like we've reached the end of another one of our videos, and I really want to thank you for spending time with us today as we went over our subject. Please be sure to check out the other popular videos that we have on our channel, and until next time, live long and prosper.